case of the Soviet Union. Tomorrow, the United States will join the Soviet Union and 33 other nations at a European Disarmament Conference in Stockholm. The conference will search for practical and meaningful ways to increase Europeans. We will be in Stockholm with the heartfelt wishes of our people for genuine progress. We live in a time of challenges to peace, but also of opportunities to peace. Through times of difficulty and frustration, we believe that 1984 finds the United States in the strongest position in years to establish a constructive and realistic working relationship with the Soviet Union. We've come a long way since the decade of the 70s in threat. Over the last 10 years, the Soviets devoted twice as much of their gross national product to military expenditures as that wars begin when governments believe the price of aggression is cheap. To keep the peace, we and our allies must be strong enough to convince state from the American people to change course, and we have. With the support of the American people in the Congress, we halted America's decline. Our economy is now in the midst of the best recovery since the 60s. Thus, to keep weakening ourselves, they've been saying for years that our demise was inevitable. They said it was, and they probably started believing it. Well, if so, I think they can see now they were wrong. This may be the reason that we've been hearing such strident reckonings out. America's deterrence is more credible, and it is making the world a safer place. Safer because now there is less danger that the Soviet leadership will underestimate our strength or question our resolve. Yes, historic deterrence has made the world safer is not to say that it's safe enough. We're witnessing tragic conflicts in many parts of the world. Nuclear arsenals are far too high. And our working relationship with the Soviet Union is not what it must be. These are conditions which must be addressed and improved. Push away the differences between our two societies and our philosophies. But we should always remember that we do have a common interest. And the foremost among them is to avoid war and reduce the level of arms. There is no rational alternative for competition. And if we do so, we might find areas in which we could engage in constructive cooperation. Our strength and vision of progress provide the basis for demonstrating with equal conviction our commitment to stay secure and to find peaceful solutions to problems through negotiations. That's why 1984 is a year of opportunities for peace. But if the United States and the Soviet Union are to rise to the challenges facing us, I propose that our governments make a major effort to see if we can make progress in three broad problem areas. First, we need to find ways to reduce and eventually to eliminate the threat and use of force in some ended nations are confronted with and exporting violence only exacerbate local tensions, increase suffering and make solutions to real social and economic problems more difficult. Further, such activity carries with it the risk of larger confrontations. The task should be to find ways to reduce the vast stockpiles of armaments in the world. It's tragic to see the world's developing nations spending more than $150 billion. We must find ways to reverse the vicious cycle of threat and response which drives arms races everywhere it occurs. With regard to nuclear weapons, one's people in the Western world reduces it. Peaceful trade helps, while organized theft of industrial secrets certainly hurts. Cooperation and understanding are especially important to arms control. Examples I've cited illustrate why our relationship with the Soviet Union is not what it should be. We have a long way to go, but we're determined to try and try again. We may have to start in small ways, but start we must. In working on these tasks, our approach is to recognize that we're in a long-term competition with a government that does not share our notions of individual liberties at home and peaceful change abroad. We must be frank in acknowledging our differences and unafraid to promote our values. 
Strength is essential to negotiate successfully and protect our interests. If we're weak, as we were three years ago. Our strength is necessary to deter war and to facilitate negotiated solutions. Soviet leaders know it makes sense to compromise only if they can get something in return. I don't know why this should come as a surprise to Soviet leaders who've never shied from expressing their view of our system. But this doesn't mean that we can't deal with each other. We don't refuse to talk when the Soviets call us imperialist aggressors and worse, or because they cling to the fantasy of a communist triumph over democracy. The fact that neither of us likes the other system is no reason to refuse to talk. Living in this nuclear age, Indeed, we fought common enemies in World War II. Today, our common enemies are poverty, disease, and above all, war. More than 20 years ago, President Kennedy defined and said, but let us also direct attention to our common interests and to the means by which those differences can be resolved. But those differences are differences in governmental structure and philosophy. The common interests have to do with the things of everyday life for people everywhere. Just suppose with me for a moment that an Ivan and an Anya could find themselves, say, in a waiting room or sharing a shelter from the rain or the storm with a gym and salad. pleasure to welcome you all here, and I know we all have share a great many concerns about the situation in the Middle East. Our goal, let me just say briefly, is what it has always been from the time I made the proposal a year ago, September 1st, about a peace process I meant for the entire Middle East. Naturally, it had to start with trying to resolve the situation that was tearing Lebanon apart. I think we've made some great progress, but I think we've got to make a great deal more. We've got to stop the killing, and, and uh, I just want to assure you before we get into anything here, I am convinced that uh, some of the talk that's been going on and the criticism that if we withdrew the multinational forces, <coughs> it would be a disaster. And, uh, we're going to keep on trying and hope we can prevent that disaster. Now I know you have some things that you want to... Yes, sir. 
we've spent some time putting together what we would call an overview of our fundamental concerns. Before I get into that, I'd like to first say on behalf of all of us here, and in fact, uh, all of the members of the National Association of Arab Americans, we want to thank you for this opportunity. Uh, we appreciate it very much. We do think that, if possible, a regular, a regular exchange of ideas. Just got your memorandum. We haven't had a chance to read it. Trying to go around the table because I think we shorten our time if we do. Please sit down. Yeah. You going down? 
Sir, could you tell us how you feel personally about the reaction to your speech yesterday? Here we are. We're taking questions. We're not supposed to. <laughs> He's not a head of state. <laughs> <laughs> All this time? <laughs> no, I thought it was reasonable. He's not in the state. See, I just seen something that we ought to do with these. Uh, Larry, as you've seen, we've been careless about solving. There's a couple of those gals, those TV cameras on the show, that are very short. They came on the tail end. They all have the time to finally squeeze them out and shove the camera between you. They're always last in line to have to pick through them. Somebody ought out there, put them in the front of the line, let them in first. <laughs> Where? I really thought that the that kind of thing had been outdated in diplomacy. People no longer did this kind of thing. very strange, complicated, and involuted and Machiavellian kind of procedure. Now, this business of uh, Kuczynski proposing to me that I consider the uh, suggestion of equal reductions on both sides, and then uh, later calling me out of bed one night to tell me that he had instructions from his government. 